the generally accepted rule of thumb is that as you get older, your investment portfolio should get more conservative. But a group of professors have come along to challenge this long-held belief. They looked at three main retirement metrics to determine if it makes sense to become more conservative with your money over time or stay aggressive by investing in 100% stocks forever. The results are pretty eye-opening, so let me show you what they found and how a misunderstanding in the data could lead to significant losses for investors. The strategy that's usually recommended for investors is often referred to as a glide path. It gradually adjusts the asset allocation of a retirement portfolio over time, typically by reducing exposure to riskier assets like stocks and increasing exposure to more conservative assets like bonds as the individual approaches retirement. The goal is to protect all those accumulated savings from significant losses right before and during retirement. Now this paper challenges two ideas of investing. Number one, investors should diversify across stocks and bonds in retirement. And two, the young should hold more stocks than the old. The results are based on simulating the life cycle of couples in the United States. Here's an idea of what these people look like from start to finish. Both adults save during their working years, then completely stop working and do nothing but consume during their retirement years. Starting at age 25, they save 10% of their gross monthly income and continue doing so every year until they retire at age 65. Now this 10% does include their employer's contribution. During those 40 working years, an individual will most likely experience some sort of unemployment or non-employment for a period of time, so they did account for that in this study. Each couple adopts what they call a lifetime portfolio strategy to invest for retirement. Now this means that they invest the same way their whole lives starting at age 25. Here are the eight asset allocations they had different couples investing in to determine which ones ended up better off across a few different metrics. As you can see, we have a little bit of everything. From the conservative side of things, we have our target date funds two different 60-40 portfolios, a stock and bond portfolio with the allocation changing purely based on age and T-bills, which I don't know who in their right mind would ever invest in 100% T-bills forever, but they did add it in here. Then for the more aggressive side of things, we have our wild people who only invest in stocks. The first is 100% domestic stocks and the other is a 50-50 split between domestic and international. At age 65, the couple retires and begins receiving social security for the remainder of their life, which is their first source of income. Their second source of income is the withdrawals they take from their retirement accounts. Each couple withdraws from their portfolio at a constant rate every year using the 4% rule. This means that they withdraw 4% the first year, then adjust based on inflation every year. As a side note, the authors also tested a few other withdrawal rates to see how things would play out, so I'll show you those results later in the video. Because the couple's life expectancy is uncertain, they modeled it using the Social Security Administration's mortality tables. The median age of the last survivor is 88.9. Sorry, gentlemen, the odds are against us being the last survivor. <laughs> As my grandpa always told me, sucks to suck, Jared. Let's look at the wealth of these couples at age 65 when they retire. Real quick, I'm going to flash on screen what each portfolio means as a refresher before I go through these results. So pause the video real quick and use that photographic memory of yours if you need to. As you'd expect, since all of these couples have been buying and holding during their working years, the ones who invested in 100% stocks have a higher average balance of a little over $1 million compared to something like a target date fund couple who only has about $810,000. Based on the 4% withdrawal rate, that's a yearly spending difference of about $10,000. Averages can be a little misleading, so if we look at the median balances, we can see that the globally diversified stock portfolio has about $150,000 more in it, which is an extra $6,000 of spending money for the first year of retirement. I know it's really exciting to see how high the numbers are on the right side of the graph, but we need to focus just just as much on the left side as well. It wasn't all fun and games for 100% domestic stock investors because there was higher downside risk. The couples who did worse than 50% of their peers in the same group ended up with the same amount or even less than the ones who invested in bonds. I'm an optimistic person in general, so I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here. 
I just want to make sure that everyone is fully aware of the potential downsides. So it seems that the globally diversified stock investors ended up with higher lows compared to everyone else when it didn't work out very well for them. When it comes to the amount of money left over, once the surviving spouse passes away, on average, most of the bond investors were left with around $1 million and the 100% stock investors had double that. Even if we look at the percentile breakdown, most of these couples, no matter how they invested, at least had something left but the all stock investors did much better. Check that out though. In the 25th percentile, the 100% domestic stock investors only had about $100,000 left, which is on par with some of those bond investors. To achieve those final balances, all these investors would have needed to endure watching their account balances take a big hit while still withdrawing money. While the all stock portfolios ended up with more money, they each saw 63 and 50% drawdowns. To put it another way, if the 100% stock investor had an account worth $1 million, then at one point during retirement, it would have lost $630,000. This couple would have needed to be confident enough to withdraw 4% to cover expenses while their account was only worth $370,000. Plus, investment accounts don't drop like that for no reason. When this happens, there are terrible things going on in the world that make you question everything. So how likely was it that these people with different portfolios ran out of money while they were alive? The authors of this paper call it the probability of ruin. The balanced portfolio with international stocks has the lowest probability of ruin at 10.9% within the group of bond portfolios and the highest is the target date fund with 16.9%. Look at the probability of ruin for the 100% domestic stock fund, 17.4%. That's higher than any of the portfolios with bonds in them. The globally diversified stock portfolio, on the other hand, is the least likely to run out of money at 8.2%. With these probability of ruin numbers, keep in mind that it's only regarding their investment portfolios. Since these couples still have social security, they technically still have income coming in every single month. Of course, this wouldn't be the most ideal situation and should be avoided if possible, but it's not like these people are guaranteed to be homeless, living on the streets, turning tricks for their next meal. Here are the probabilities of running out of money when we compare the 4% withdrawal rate to a 3 and 5%. As you'd imagine, the 5% withdrawal rate is high enough to make anyone a little uncomfortable, and 3% seems a little better, especially when you see how low it is for a globally diversified stock portfolio. What I find interesting is how high the probability of ruin is for the 100% domestic stock investor at the 3 and 4% withdrawal rate. It appears to never be a good idea to only invest in one country. So what does this mean for us as investors? Should we ignore the rule of thumb that says to add bonds as we get older or stick with 100% stocks all the way through? Well, not so fast because I think that there are a few things that this paper misses. First, stocks have always had higher expected returns compared to bonds. It's no surprise that a portfolio with 100% stocks will most likely outperform one with bonds over time. And the whole paper is based on the total return regardless of anything else. This is all well and good for someone investing in 100% stocks during their working years when they have the time and the active income to make up for any losses. But for someone in retirement with less time to recover from losses, it's about way more than maximizing returns at all costs. Among many other things, it's about accounting for the risk involved with investing in a 100% stock portfolio versus something like say, a diversified 60-40 portfolio. Research has shown risk aversion in both young adults and older adults with greater risk aversion in those older adults. This is one reason risk adjusted returns are important to understand. They're going to help you see which investment is actually better when you consider risk. It's like saying for every bit of risk I take, how much money do I make? We can compare the risk of different portfolios by looking at something called the Sharpe Ratio. In simple terms, the higher the number, the less risky when compared to others. Here are three portfolios I put together. The 100% stock portfolio ended up with higher returns compared to the other two, but it has the lowest Sharpe Ratio which means that from a risk adjusted perspective, it's not an attractive way to invest. By the way, taking on risk isn't a bad thing. 
in retirement, you still need to have some money exposed to stocks so it continues to grow, which is why even though the 100% bond portfolio has a higher sharp ratio, it probably doesn't make sense to invest all of your money that way. The goal is to find a nice sweet spot that you feel comfortable with. Looking at this study, it only tells us the end result, what it fails to account for is what happened along the way. It assumes that nothing changes about these couples other than their age. They are compliant, rational robots who do everything based on what the rule book says every single time. The last time I checked, the only thing this perfect and well-behaved is my dog Molly while we're hiking in the woods. Molly, stop. Good girl, stay. Good girl, stay. Rochambeau, red, reject, written, release. Good girl, good job. Unlike dogs, humans are balls of emotion that act extremely irrational at unpredictable times. When we consider the volatility and the large drawdowns of a portfolio, plus whatever random thing is going on in someone's personal life at those times, you'd be absolutely insane to assume someone can stay invested in 100% stocks and follow the rules 100% of the time. If anything, the more stocks someone holds, the more vulnerable they are to making irrational decisions. Maybe a one, two, or 3% drop in value won't make you flinch, but all it takes is something random happening in the world at the same time your portfolio drops 10, or 20% and the 100% stock portfolio that seemed like a great idea is now a bigger nightmare than your ex-mother-in-law. So yeah, I just don't buy this part of the whole paper. Real life is not a spreadsheet. Making fearless, emotionless robot assumptions to determine how to invest doesn't make any sense. Like I always say, the okay 60-40 or 80-20 portfolio you can stick to is better than the perfect 100% stock one that you cannot. And this couldn't be more true for someone who is retired with no income from a traditional career. While I understand why they use a 4% withdrawal rate to cover spending, it's still problematic when considering that bold claim that someone is better off investing in 100% stocks. This is mainly because retirement spending is more dynamic than us pre-retirees realize. There's a concept called the retirement spending smile, which explains that spending doesn't stay constant throughout retirement. Typically, retirees spend more at the beginning of their retirement when they're healthier and more active. Spending tends to decrease during the middle years, only to rise again toward the end of life due to increased healthcare costs. The rise in spending towards the end has been debated. Some say that it goes back up to initial retirement levels, and others say it goes up, but not to that same level. I don't know who is correct, and frankly, I don't care because we're splitting hairs here between probably a bunch of nerds. All you need to know is that the number generally goes back up as you get closer to being blasted off into another dimension forever. forever. So while the 4% rule provides a useful guideline, the outcome for portfolios with bonds would actually last longer when we account for lower withdrawal rates during the middle years of retirement. You can actually model a more dynamic retirement spending plan through the do-it-yourself retirement software that I personally use, New Retirement. I'll have a link in the description if you wanna check it out. One aspect that was missing in this paper, which I wish they would have included, is information on how quickly their portfolios of couples failed. This detail is important because if, for example, two portfolios failed, but one did so after seven years and the other after 14 years, then there would be more time to adjust and course correct the portfolio with the longer lifespan. Although I don't have data to support this claim, it seems likely that a 100% stock portfolio would fail faster than one that includes a portion invested in bonds due to the more significant downturns experienced by an all stock portfolio. While I'm glad there are people doing these types of studies to hopefully start more conversations around investing for retirement, we have to take it all with a grain of salt. Theory and practice don't always match up perfectly. Nothing against some of these lifelong academic professionals, but there's usually more to the story that needs to be taken into account. If someone is going into retirement thinking that they have to take on the risk of investing in 100% stocks to make it through, then that tells me there is something very wrong with this situation. 
Walking into a casino to try to fix your financial problems is never the answer. On the other hand, I do know that there is a subset of the population who is comfortable taking on more risk by investing in 100% stocks forever. If that's you, then go for it. I couldn't care less either way because it's your money and I'm not your daddy. And if you think I'm your father, then tell your mother I'm sorry. There are a lot more levers that you can pull to make your money last in retirement. I created a free guide laying out each one, which you can get a copy of in the description down below. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button before you go. Done.